My name is Ava, um, and I'll be talking about environmental justice today for you guys. So environmental justice is a very large and complicated issue. So if anything I say um, interests you, I really encourage you to write it down and uh, Google it later, learn more about it. We're just going to kind of get an introduction of what it is today. Um, but again, definitely write those things down. Um, I really encourage you to learn on your own as well. Um, so I really quickly just wanted to give a quick about me. Um, hi, again, I'm Ava. I'm 21 years old. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I'm currently a student at UCLA, um, and I study environmental science. So everything that we just talked about, that's what I do. So I learn about the science behind things like climate change and weather patterns, volcanoes, ocean tides, all that good stuff. And I also learn a lot about the relationship between humans and the environment, basically how we affect it and how it affects us right back. Um, I threw in a couple of pictures of me. Here's one of me and my friends at school. One of them, the one in the white shirt is actually also an environmental scientist and I live with her. So we get to chat about all these things and it's very fun in our apartment. And then there's me in my home state, Washington. Back in August, I really love to hike. So that's the way I interact with nature a lot. Um, that's in the Cascades, back in Washington state. So very fun, love this stuff. Um, Okay, as I said, so one of the main focuses that um, we have at school is uh, the relationship between humans and the environment. And what it really comes down to is the fact that human activity has a really strong and direct impact on the Earth's climate. Um, if you know about the greenhouse effect, this might just be review for you and that's totally fine. Um, review is good, but if this is new to you, I'll just break it down really simply. Basically, uh, the sun emits a lot of energy and thermal energy, heat waves, those come into contact with the earth. And a lot of them um, escape back into space, so they just reflect, right, and then just go back out. Um, and then the rest is held um, in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are really, really good at trapping heat. And we actually need greenhouse gases. If there was no greenhouse gas, then it would be very cold and life would likely not be possible at all. So we need some greenhouse gases, but um, right now we have a situation where there's just too much of them. And a lot of that is due to human activity. So factory activity, oil drilling, when you hop in your car to go to your friend's house, when you hop on a plane to go to another country, all of these things emit greenhouse gases. And over time, um, they trap heat in the atmosphere, which causes a steady rise in global temperature known as global warming. And global warming, as mentioned before, causes changes in large, uh, sorry, causes large changes in regional and global climate patterns. And we call that climate change. So these two big phenomenons, global warming and climate change, we kind of have a situation where you can't have one without the other. Um, Something that was very, very important to note though, is that although these are global issues, climate change and global warming do not affect everybody equally. I think there's a common misconception that like, oh, it's a global thing. That means we all encounter it, right? It's true, but some people encounter it uh, quicker, more rapidly and more intensely than others. And that's what we're gonna look at today. Um, I have a quick visualization to help you understand that. Um, this is what equal distribution looks like. So I want everybody to think of the factory with three communities surrounding it. Um, in the case of like an equalizing situation, this means that all of the communities are receiving the same amounts of pollution. So community A, B, and C are all receiving one little puffy cloud of pollution. This is equal. What we actually are dealing with here is unequal distribution. So you can see that community A and B are pretty much fine. They're not receiving anything. Um, but community C is receiving the brunt of the exposure. And I want everybody to think to themselves, okay, is this fair? Maybe pop it in the chat. Do you think this is fair? I actually can't see the chat, but I'm hoping that there are a lot of no's, right? Um, this is not fair. I've, I don't think community C raised their hand and was like, hey, wait, can we get some more pollution? You know, nobody really wants that. Um, so this is when environmental justice becomes really, really important because the word justice, you know, means, is it just, is it fair? And we just said, this is not fair, right? And we see this kind of situation of more communities, of some communities being more at risk than others play out at a lot of different levels um, when it comes to climate change. So moving on, we are going to watch this quick video um, on environmental justice. It really breaks it down, gives a lot of visuals and examples. And I really encourage you to pay close attention because we will be playing a Kahoot right after. 
Um, so I will let the video do the talking. Okay, so this is a city. Here are all the people living in it. People of all different colors, ages, wealths, and incomes. Except they don't all live together in the same place. They're separated into different parts of the city by what color they are, what language they speak, and how much money they have. And those different parts of the city look quite different. The parts that are whiter and wealthier tend to have green spaces, grocery stores with nutritious organic food, and of course some money to buy it, and are often far away from pollution emitting freeways. The parts that are poorer and more diverse tend to have industrial sites, heavy duty diesel polluted ports and highways, and hazardous waste. All things that the city relies on to run properly, but that heavily pollute the air and water. And even if they had those grocery stores with nutritious organic food, most residents there couldn't afford it anyway. How did this happen? Well, this segregation can be traced back to race-based zoning and housing policies, but it wasn't always as deliberate as plain old racism. Some separations can simply be traced to poor land use planning. And as a result, these residents of the same city live very different lives. Say the city realizes it has an emissions problem. It comes up with a plan to reduce air pollution, plant more trees to suck up the carbon, or start a cap-and-trade program. But those trees get planted in the neighborhoods that are already green, and the factories that are spewing toxins into the air just buy more carbon offsets and keep spewing their toxins. The benefits of these programs are enjoyed by the communities that are already doing just fine, and the communities that were hurting most from all that air pollution, well, they're still hurting. This isn't just an imaginary city, this is the story of real cities all across the US where people might live in the very same area code, but their race, ethnicity, or wealth and income bracket causes them to experience wildly different quality of air, water, and life. In fact, it can even mean that they also experience different deaths. That's how serious this stuff is. This kind of inequity expands far beyond cities, too. Rural areas are full of commercially valuable resources like oil and coal, and they're also home to indigenous and low-income communities. But when those resources are extracted, those communities don't see any of the money, and they end up with all the air and water contamination that's left over from the extraction. And we even see this injustice on a global level, like in small island nations that are forced to directly confront the consequences of rising sea levels, but haven't played any significant role in the industries that are causing climate change. These peoples are sometimes forced to flee their homes because their land is literally going underwater. But the very states that did play a hand in creating climate change don't have migration policies to accommodate them. So when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about how we can try to break down and reimagine a system that's built up on these inequities. A system where those who are already disadvantaged because of their race and economic status are made poorer because they're unable to profit from the resources that the world depends on and are made sick or worse by the environmental contamination that comes with extracting those resources. Social inequities are intimately tied to the environment. That's why social justice is an environmental issue too. Okay. All right. Okay, so now it's time to see how well we were paying attention and what stuff. Um, I'm going to open real quick the hoot that we have set up. Okay, so if everybody can pull out, um, maybe open another window, or you can also do this on a cell phone if you have one. Uh, go ahead and go to kahoot.com and type in that game pin right there, and then we can play a little game. We'll give everybody about a minute to do this. Sydney's joined. Taz, welcome, Taz. Hi, Katie. Welcome, Paige. Awesome. Nice. Okay, looks like we have about nine. Maybe give it 10 more seconds for any stragglers and then we'll get started. All 
All right, well, let's get started then. All right, so the first question. Okay, which of these does not determine where people live within a city? The options are race, language spoken, wealth, and gender. Awesome, gender is the correct answer. As a video mentioned, race, wealth, and language spoken all contribute. Um, to where somebody might live in a city. Nice job. Okay, James, nice work. Sydney's closer behind, so is Taz. Okay, which of these does not tend to be found in poor, diverse areas of cities? We have industrial sites, polluted parts, hazardous waste, and open green spaces. Open green spaces, everybody got that right. Nice job. Um, this is quite common in large metropolitan areas, the poor, more diverse areas, um, lack green spaces, which actually contribute to um, temperatures because you know if there aren't any shady areas, then um, you're in the direct sunlight and concrete is really good at making things hot. So this is a big problem. Moving on. Sydney takes the lead. Nice job, Sydney. Okay, what are some commercially valuable resources found in rural areas? Oil and coal, valuable gemstones, water, sand and quartz. Okay, great answer. Okay, a little bit of split there. Um, oil and coal, is actually the largest um, commercially valuable resource found in rural areas. That's why we have a lot of issues with um, drilling and drilling specifically in um, poorer areas. And that becomes you know, an issue of um, environmental injustice. All right, that's it. And let's see who won. Congratulations, Paige, third place, not too shabby. All right, Nancy, let's go. Taz, wow, that was a quick turnaround. Nice job, well done, well done, awesome. All right, let's get back to the presentation. Nice job, everybody. Um, that's a really helpful video for me just to refer back to. Um, I do it quite a bit just to remind ourselves what, what really goes into environmental justice and what it means. All right, um, back to the definition. I thought it would be helpful to provide um, an actual definition word by word. This is provided by the EPA and that's the Envi Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. If you don't know what the EPA is, it's basically the largest federal body that is concerned with the environment. And they define environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development and implementation of environmental law and policies. So those are a lot of really big words, but I want you to pay attention to uh, the two parts that it addresses. So first we have the fair treatment of all people. That means we're not choosing um, vulnerable communities as locations for toxic waste sites. That's not fair, that's not fair treatment at all. So it addresses that part. And it also addresses uh, the meaningful involvement of all people when it comes to the development and imp implementation of environmental law and policy. This is really, really important. We need to make sure that everybody has a stake in the um, in the processes that dictate, you know, whether or not they live in areas with green spaces or whether or not they're exposed to more toxins than they should be. Because what it really comes down to is the fact that people should not be subjected to exposures that they are not responsible for creating in the first place. Um, I'd love to point out also that this movement is really heavily rooted in history. The fight for environmental justice has been ongoing for years. As you can see, this top right photo, these are protesters in Warren County, North Carolina, um, 1982. I highly recommend you Google that specific case. Um, it's kind of seen as one of the main origins of the environmental justice movement. But um, the environmental justice movement does have roots uh, that um, are a bit Farther back than that, it actually uh, is said to have been developed around the time of the civil rights movement, so around the 60s in the United States. 
Um, and then we have protesters um, about five years ago in the bottom right of the page um, protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016. Again, a really important um, environmental justice situation that I recommend looking into. Um, now I would love to watch another video, just a bit of it because it is a little bit longer, but this is Josiah Edwards. He lives in Carson, California. So he's our neighbor. This is in Los Angeles County. And he's going to talk a little bit about um, California specific instances of environmental injustice. We'll play that. Growing up in Carson, a city in Los Angeles County, as a black kid with childhood asthma, my parents were always worried about my ability to just breathe. I couldn't participate in gym class like normal kids, so I always had to have my inhaler on me. And to make matters worse, my middle school was less than a few miles away from one of the biggest refineries west of the Mississippi. In LA County, over half a million people live within a half mile of an active oil well, which spews dangerous chemicals like benzene into the air. And of the 1.8 million Californians most impacted by environmental pollution, 92% are people of color. Living near oil production is deadly, increasing the risk of asthma, nosebleeds, respiratory issues, high-risk pregnancies, and cancer. Neighborhood drilling is one of the most visible forms of environmental racism. So what are California's elected officials doing about it? It turns out Hollywood didn't build Los Angeles. The oil industry did. It began in the 1890s. And by the 1930s, California was producing a quarter of the world's oil. Starting around then, real estate developers used decades of redlining to force generations of black and brown communities to live in the toxic backyard of the fossil fuel industry. And from the very beginning, oil companies knew they were poisoning people. In 1943, an internal Shell Oil document marked confidential warned of harmful toxins linked to oil production, stating any exposure at all is dangerous. With about 5,000 active oil wells, Los Angeles County is the largest urban oil field in the U.S. And right next door to where I grew up is the neighborhood of Wilmington, which is 90% Latinx and surrounded by six oil refineries. Through years of hard work and organizing, we've been fighting back against environmental racism. Last year, Assemblymember Al Marasucci introduced Assembly Bill 345, which would have established buffer zones of 2,500 feet between oil and gas drilling sites and sensitive areas like schools, hospitals, and homes. But in August, state senators rejected AB 345 in a 5-4 vote. Growing Ava, I think you need to. I was muted. I just unmuted myself. I'm back. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just ended it there because he just goes on to talk about specific politicians in California. Um, if you're at all interested, I really recommend watching the rest of that. Um, but just for the purpose of this video, we're going to continue or this presentation. Um, just pointing out the fact that change is possible when we work to make it happen. Josiah Edwards, um, he's dedicated so much of his time to putting pressure on um, those elected officials, the people in power who, is, who have really committed um, or at least promised to protect the citizens um, that elected them, right? And if they're not doing those jobs, that's, that's an issue. So Josiah Edwards is um, putting necessary pressure on these politicians, which is awesome. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be doing work on the ground to make a difference. Um, one girl, Leah Thomas, uh, she now runs an intersectional environmentalist page on Instagram, which I really recommend following. Uh, they now have over 200,000 followers and every post reaches that amount of people. And they seek to educate their followers on climate issues, through an intersectional lens, meaning um, how environmental issues intersect with um, racial issues or you know gender issues. It's 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 the it's just looking at climate not in a way that's like oh it's science. No, it's it's a social issue, and then we're looking at um, how it affects us and in, in different ways depending on who we are. 
time. So I really recommend following that. But um, I just want to give an example of um, some progress here. So I want everybody to look at these people. So as I mentioned, the EPA, um, that's the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, there is a, a lead administrator on, on the EPA under each president. So the EPA was founded, I think it was 1970 or 1972. I can't remember the exact year, but it was around then. So all of these people um, have been administrators at one point. So they have been leading the EPA. Um, I want everybody to look at these faces and pop in the chat what they have in common. They're all white. Yes, we're seeing this. Do we think this is right? Does this make sense? You can say that on the chat. Yeah, I see. No, right? Absolutely not. Um, so that's very bad. And uh, the need for representation is, is felt everywhere, but especially when um, those who are suffering from climate change and environmental impacts are, are not white people, they are communities of color. So it's really, really important that we have those voices in these positions of power. Um, so not great that everybody is white here, but I will say some good news um, is Biden's pick for the uh, EPA administrator is Michael Reagan. And he, um, yeah, claps, this is excellent because representation matters all the time, but especially, especially in times when people's literal lives are at stake because of this. Um, so he will no doubt be a better voice for environmental justice than all of those white people in the past. Um, and another bonus, not, not the EPA, but um, Representative Deb Holland is the first Native American Interior Secretary, which is again, a huge move in, um, in just representation. And it's so important that we see these faces and we know that they are actually caring about these things, which is just awesome. And that's all because uh, environmental justice has been really brought to the forefront of people's attention saying this matters, you know. Um, so things are looking up. I just want to end on that note. Things are really looking up and they will continue to look up if we continue to learn, care, and take time to educate others about environmental justice and, you know, take time to educate yourselves too. There's a wealth of resources out there, um, especially on the internet. So keep learning and yeah, change is possible. Just want to end on that note. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it.